Testing. One, two. Testing. Uh, robot, robot. What are you doing? I am just testing my audio relays. I do not wish to blow my big scenes by having embarrassing technical difficulties. Ah, uh, yes, well, you're a little too late for that. You see, we're already on. What? Yes, we're already on. Look, look. When a little red light on the camera comes on, that means we're on. The show's already started. You are kidding. No, I'm not. Look, right there. See that? And I thought intergalactic travel was tough. Hmm. Stay tuned, folks. From the farthest reaches of the galaxy comes Lost in Space Forever. Starring John Larroquette with guest appearances by June Lockhart, Mark Goddard, Marta Kristen, Angela Cartwright, and special guest stars Bill Mooney and Jonathan Harris. Plus, outtakes, bloopers, scenes from the Lost in Space movie, and some special surprises. Not to mention me, the Lost in Space robot. Lost in Space Forever will return in a moment. Incredible, isn't it? It's been over 30 years since Lost in Space first appeared on television screens across America. And the adventures of the Robinson family still retain their fascination with audiences throughout the world. They have served as a basis for websites, home videos, conventions, toys, collectibles, and even a big budget motion picture. But what is it about Lost in Space that has inspired a galaxy of fans? Well, sit back, relax, and take a trip aboard the Jupiter 2 as we find out. Lost in Space was launched in the early 1960s, an era of tail-finned cars, TV dinners, Barbie dolls, and hula hoops. There were the futuristic marvels of the New York World's Fair, and the world was on the verge of a cultural revolution thanks to the invasion of a British musical group called The Beatles. It was also an era that witnessed the dawning of the space program, one which promised to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The space program excited a whole new generation, one that believed anything was possible. Young people could now imagine themselves growing up in a world where traveling to other planets would be as commonplace as a trip to the corner store. Enter Erwin Allen, an Academy Award-winning filmmaker and veteran television producer who delighted in taking audiences to prehistoric worlds. <laughs> Up in the air, courtesy of a hot air balloon. Escape disaster by a hair's breadth. And under the sea, aboard an atomic-powered submarine called the Sea View. You are there when the entire sky catches on fire. You are there when the frogmen battle a mammoth squid. After successfully bringing Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea to television in 1964, Irwin Allen saw the potential for a prime-time space adventure series one that would catapult audiences into the future and beyond their wildest imaginations. In 1965, control. Alan produced Zero this rarely seen pilot. Ladies and gentlemen, today the first of what may be as many as 10 million families per year is setting out on its epic voyage into man's newest frontier for colonization, deep space. Heading the expedition will be Dr. John Robinson, professor of astrophysics at the University of Stellar Dynamics. With him will be his wife, Dr. Maureen Robinson, the distinguished biochemist of the New Mexico College of Space Medicine. Their daughter, Judith, age 19, who has rather heroically postponed all hopes for a career in the musical comedy field. Six minutes, 40 seconds, and holding. Their son, Will, who recently was graduated from the Camdo Canyon School of Science at the age of nine, 
with the highest average in the school's history, and their daughter Penny, age 11. Their assistant, Dr. Donald West. Electromagnetic miracles now come into play. This cosmic glow, induced by the genius of advanced technology, will freeze the Robinson family into a state of suspended animation, enabling them to make a lifetime flight while aging but a second in the time of man. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Blast off! All systems here at Alpha Control are green and go. The trajectory now profiles properly. The spaceship is climbing correctly to plan. Unless fire extinguishing apparatus functions properly and control regeneration occurs immediately, all hope is now gone. Heading the distinguished cast of actors would be Guy Williams as Professor John Robinson. Look at this thing. But the day after tomorrow, the temperature will drop 150 below zero. Well, what do we do? We're going to have to head south, but fast. Williams was a familiar face to television viewers, having played Zorro for years on network television. All right, let's go. I want us to get out of here as quickly as we can. All right. Seen here is Guy's original screen test for Lost in Space. The voice you hear off screen belongs to producer Irwin Allen. Nice to have you with us. Well, it's nice being here. I want to talk a little bit about the new show we're going to do called Lost in Space. Uh-huh. Well, I saw one of those uh, little flying machines. Yeah, space saucer. Yeah. I'd like to get one for myself. Another television favorite in the cast would be June Lockhart as Dr. Maureen Robinson. Ms. Lockhart had previously played everyone's favorite mom on the classic TV series Lassie. As the Robinson children, Judy would be played by Marta Christen, a young actress who had appeared on television shows and movies. Will? Penny? How are you ever going to dress like a lady if you don't hold still? Penny would be played by Angela Cartwright, who had literally grown up before TV audiences in Make Room for Daddy. You won't be long. As young Will Robinson, Irwin Allen cast Billy Mooney, one of the busiest and most versatile child actors of the decade. It's a city! There are no cities out here for crying out loud. Then what is it? Some sort of geological accident. How do I know? That's gone. My feels electronics. Well, pardon me. Rounding out the cast was Mark Goddard as Robinson's pilot, Major Donald West. Those big boulders didn't do the power unit any good. How long to fix? A couple hours anyway. Although filmed in black and white, the pilot for Lost in Space was the most expensive ever produced up to that time. It pitted the Robinson family against earthquakes, floods, one-eyed monsters, and other eerie aliens. Fortunately, the CBS network bought the series. They loved the program's potential for lots of futuristic action adventure with a broad family appeal. But despite the show's wild premise and spectacular effects, network executives felt something was missing, something that Irwin Allen would soon remedy with an ever-present villain in the form of the nefarious Dr. Zachary Smith and a cybernetic companion named Robot B-9. Stay tuned for more of Lost in Space Forever. When it premiered on September 15th, 1965, Lost in Space was heralded as a rousing space opera. Lost in Space was an unqualified hit and due in no small part to the antics of everyone's favorite villain, 
Dr. Smith, played by Jonathan Harris. Don't trust him. He's as slippery as a bucket of eels. Just how can you help? My friend here was built to test atmospheric conditions. I'll send him out to investigate. And leave yourself defenseless? The virtuous need no defense. You need a catalyst in a show to start things rolling, to, to have people fight against pro and con. I was the con. Are you native to this speck of dust? Oh, no, not me. You have the wrong party. If it's natives you're after, there's a whole tribe of them right down there in the valley. The natives here are called Robinsons. I am, how you say, well known for my comedic villainy aspects of my acting nature, which I do enjoy. It's great fun. And I said, well, willy-nilly, I'll be out of the show in five, sh in five shots anyway. I'm going to try snaking in my old bits and see what happens. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Put a bit more snap in there, will you? Good. Excuse me, Mr. Larroquette, but you are forgetting someone. Ah, uh, hello, Robot. I was just telling everyone about Dr. Smith. Yes, I know. But I think your viewers would rather hear about the other components in Lost in Space's success. Other components? Yes. Like me, for instance. The robot on Lost in Space was the Robinson family's mechanical man Friday, capable of everything from soil sampling to lifting heavy objects and fending off enemies. The robot was, at times, just as human as his flesh and blood co-stars. There's no place like home. No one requires my services anymore. An astute observation. You, sir, have reached the end of the line. The joy ride is over. I had planned to redesign you possibly into a pleasure vehicle, but I think you would be substandard even as that. What is my course of action? A quick departure seems a very good choice. Are you sure there is no other solution? None whatsoever. Goodbye. Of course, the robot's human qualities came naturally thanks to the man inside him, actor Bob May. I was a little too big for it, but I squeezed in knowing that there's thousands of actors wanting a job like this, and I spent three years in the bucket. I'm very happy about it. Bob utilized years of stage training to give the robot a very unique personality. Equally distinctive was the voice of the robot, provided by veteran radio and television announcer Dick Tufeld. You may apply more effort, Dr. Smith. My skin is not sensitive. That's what you say. And do not miss any spots. If it is worth doing, it is worth doing well. I get calls from all over the country from people uh, wanting me to do things like do the robot voice for their answering machine. Warning! 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 It will not compute! Warning! 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 Danger, Will Robinson! Feel better now, robot? Yes, thank you. My sensors are deeply grateful. May I continue? Affirmative. Of course, there were other reasons for Lost in Space's impressive success in its debut season. There were dazzling special effects. An impressive array of guests.